for tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday morning, May the 23rd, 1998. Memorial Weekend Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Harlan Deem of Beaumont, Texas is the speaker of the morning. Well, let's pray. Father, in the name of yes, Jesus, Lord. we just thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people and proclaim your greatness and your mercy and your deliverance. And, Lord, that you truly are the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Yes, Lord. Yes. And, Lord, we lift you up high and lifted up. Yes. yes. Lord, we see you high and lifted up oh, tonight, yes. this day. Oh, yes, do. Hallelujah. And uh, we ask the Holy Spirit's indulgence with us today, Lord. Just We know, Lord, that there's times when uh, we would like to be the uh, epitome of uh preaching and ministering in that, Lord, but we realize that we fall so short, and we ask you, Lord, to just uh, have mercy on us. Indulge our indulgences and just cleanse us, Lord. Let us be cleansed by the Word. Let us be cleansed by the blood and the testimony of that blood. Let Let this become real in our lives today, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are looking at a quite a mixed bunch out there, a mixed group. We've got some old saints and we've got some young ones. Uh, who's the youngest saint here today? Who has just been born again in the last week? Has just received Jesus in the last week? The last month? The last year? The last six, uh, 18 months? Got somebody here that's just 18 months old in the Lord? Two years old? All right. Well, what we're see, uh, we're looking at, you can't ever tell in a group this size. You've got some that may not have even received the Lord yet. But everybody needs to be born again and uh, make that commitment. And so... Uh, our responsibility is to feed God's sheep. Now, if you're not a, one of God's sheep, well, then what you're going to be fed, may you may have to regurgitate it. But we pray that the Lord will be merciful to you and give you something that will encourage you to come on in and join up, Amen. become a part of, and Hallelujah. become active. So, we're going to work today on uh, the basis of all deliverance work. And uh, if we were going to put a title on any of this, it would be The Casting Out of Evil Spirits or Demons is Every Believer's Job. The, uh, I've, I've said this before and I'll repeat it. One of the pastors of one of the big churches down in our area came to me one day, or assistant pastor, and he said, Brother Dean, why is it that after we have a deliverance minister in and deliverance is taught, everybody just wants to do deliverance? Everybody gets in and they, everybody wants to take up and, and cast out demons, and, and everything is a demon from that for a period of time till we can get it cooled down and squashed down. And I thought about it, and I said, well, that's interesting, but I said... Uh, I would say that it's every believer's job. You know, casting out demons is the only thing in the Scripture that really ever ever Christian can be. You don't have to have a five-fold ministry. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a <laughs> an evangelist, an apostle, a prophet, uh, or a teacher to cast out demons. Is that right? You just have to be a believer. Amen. And the, the, the demons are always wanting to know who you are. If you get to challenging them, they're going to say, who are you? And you remember, I wasn't in the service, but people that were in the service tell me that when they were on guard duty, you know, you was never on guard duty that you weren't in your uniform, 
And your uniform represents who you represent and who you are, doesn't it? And when the enemy tries to come through the line, you challenge him, halt who goes there. And usually at the same time you say that, well, you put that shell in the chamber and you hear that thing go click, click, and the guy over there on the other side, he stops. I mean, you got him. But that's what you have to do. You have to learn that when the enemy's a presence, you have to challenge him. And you have to be in uniform. He has to know, he's going to want to know who you are to challenge him. I mean, who are you to challenge me? I'm coming through the lines. And uh, you've got to know who you are. Are you a G.I. Joe or are you a G.I. Jesus? Are you a Jesus issue? And so what is the answer to that particular question? Have you thought about it? Because you're going to have to have some quick answer that's there, and you need to have that established whenever you go into the battle, because you don't have time to stop and say, well, wait a minute, I better, check down. I better go down here and check and see who I am. Can you get off of that one? Uh, I don't want to have to wait till I get in the battle and then start putting on the armor. You know, uh, as we get into the things of God, we put the armor on. And uh, I remember one time we was casting out some demons, and we had the demon manifest, and, and I was kind of leading the work there, and I st shut everything down, and I said, wait a minute now. I said, we've got some young people here. We, everybody needs to put their armor on. And so we started putting the armor on. And the Lord reproved me of that. And he says, son, he says, you put the armor on before you get in the battle, and then you never take it off. Did you know you don't have to take the armor off to examine it? You don't have to take the helmet of salvation off and look at it and say, now this is the helmet of salvation, and uh, it does this, this, and this, and I'm going to use it. No, you leave the helmet on, and then you talk about the helmet of salvation. You don't have to take it off and dissect it in order to do that. You don't have to take uh, the gospel shoes off to talk about the gospel shoes. You can have them on and sit down and be talking about the gospel shoes. So it's important that you, as a soldier, you know the basics. The... Uh, Lord was showing me one time, says, you know, says, if you're a general in the army and you are in, in charge, and we're in charge in Jesus, aren't we? Yes. And you happen to go down to the beach and you're down there swimming, or you go out here on the lake and you're in your bathing suit and you're swimming, and uh, the uh, enemy manifests, and you have a problem with him and you need to do something, and you've got to say, now, wait a minute, I've got to go put my armor on. I'm, I'm out of uniform. I'm in a swimsuit out here in a boat, and I can't do anything right now because I'm out of armor or I'm out of, out of dress. Is that true? Does a general have power because he's a general or because of his uniform? I mean, if, it's, if he's a general or if he's a commander, if he's a soldier in that army, he has the duty of the soldier whether he's in uniform or not. Is that right? It's based upon who he is. And it's important, see, that we know that. So when we begin to look at every believer's job, and it will, it, uh, it'll mess up a church. If you've got a nice, neat church at home, back where you're at and that, and you bring deliverance into it, it'll mess it up. Now, if you don't know that, well, you just go ahead and work on it and find out. And, you know, uh, these are some of those divisive things that we bring into the church. But, you know, there was not anybody any more divisive than Jesus was when he came, was he? That's right. I mean, we've got a good example. Yes, we have. Amen. <laughs> if you're not being divisive in these things, you're not following Jesus. Stop and think about it. Is that right? Yes. I mean, we're going to have to be divisive in this because nobody likes to hear about demons. We all wish they were, didn't exist. Is that right? Sister Kathy, didn't, wouldn't you rather that they didn't exist at all? I mean, that's going to come when we get a new heaven and a new earth. 
when they do away with the need for reproduction, when they do away with the need for having new births and births and rebirths in that city. God has a plan, and one day there's going to be a place to where He's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth, and it's all going to be cleansed, and there will not be any more people, as we know people, that demons can dwell in. Is that right, brother? Back over in Revelation 22, isn't it? Isn't that about where it's at? There's going to come a new heaven and a new earth. But up to that time, we've still got to deal with flesh and blood. And as long as we're dealing with flesh and blood, well, we're going to have a place for demons to dwell. Now, I'm going to get into a little bit of that today. I'm just giving you an introduction right now. Uh, the devil's master plan is to cause us to be rejected. That's the reason Jesus went to the cross, and when he hung on the cross, he made an exchange. All the power that God has in his kingdom and the word is invested in the cross. Not the thing with the cross on it, but what happened on that cross. We don't hold up the cross. We hold up the person who was lifted up on the cross, and all the power is there. When you take it and put it in water baptism, you have put it in a creek. Stop and think now. Somebody says, can you go to heaven without being water baptized? And I said, well, yeah, but who wants to? I mean, that would happen if you got saved, you received Jesus and died the next minute and didn't have time to be water baptized. Well, you're in Jesus, you're okay. But if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to follow Him in baptism, aren't you? So who wants to, be, who wants to go to heaven without having some time to serve Jesus and to grow? And as a baby Christian, the reason I was asking to start with, as a baby Christian, when you're a year old in the Lord, you're still a baby Christian. And you may be 20 years old in the Lord and still be a baby Christian, depending upon the amount of light that God has graced you with. Yes, hallelujah. You can be 20 to 30 years old and still having many problems, still having uh, the same old, same olds and that... Hopefully, well, you after 20 years, you're doing better. I feel like I'm doing a little better than I was the first five or six years. But, uh, you know, there's growth. And as we grow, who's getting bigger? Does Jesus get bigger? No, He don't get any bigger. He's full growing. He's as big as He's going to get. But what's, going, what's happening? We are becoming more and more and more in tune with Him, and, and our measure of Him in us is increasing. We have more of the measure of the understanding. And so we're, we're increasing, we're growing. And it's important, see. So when we look to a mixed group like this, we've got Christians in here of all ages and experiences and all kinds of things, and some of us have fought these problems for years and didn't know what we was fighting. We begin to get some deliverance, begin to get some help, begin to realize there is some help. And God wants to take a group of people, when He comes back, He wants to have a group of people that's fully grown, Amen. mature. Scripture calls them perfect, but it means without, not without sin, but fully mature, fully grown, fully able and capable and understanding the programs and the plans of God. So, let's uh, look at Mark 16. 15 and 17, not that you haven't already looked at these scriptures and know them, but if you're just new to deliverance and you're just beginning to uh, come here, you want to listen to the, get one of the tapes and you want to follow the tape through and, and add, well, it's good to just see it in the Word. Uh, in Mark 16, in the Great Commission in Mark, we have the scripture that we're all familiar with that's been in this for very long and that is that these signs shall follow them that believe. And that's the reason it's important that you know that you're a believer. Because there's people out there that are believers that, as one brother said one time, unbelieving believers. You know what an unbelieving believer is? That's a believer that believes this part, but don't believe this part. You know, you have to believe that Jesus was came and died on the cross for you to pay for your sins and receive him into your life to be born again, you don't have to believe that Jonah was swallowed of a big fish. 
But I don't find it any problem to believe that Jonah was swallowed of a big fish, but that's not mandatory for salvation. See, to become a baby Christian, to get started in that, uh, you believe that Jesus died for you and he was raised from the dead, and you'll be saved. And then you'll find out as you begin to get born again and you begin to the regeneration of your heart and that after a while where well, you figure out, well, hey, I believe Jonah was swallowed of a big fish too. You'll find out that the whole counsel of God becomes within your capacity to believe. Where before it wasn't. So let's don't major on the whole thing right now. Let's major on the part that we're working with. Uh, one guy says, well, Brother Dame says you're majoring on minors and minoring on majors and say those things aren't important. And I looked at him and I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. That's not important. It's important enough that God put it in the book. Where did you get the authority to make a decision on what's important and what's not? Who called you to be able to redesign the automobile and, you know, you take your car down to get it worked on and... The mechanic gets under there and he takes some parts off and he puts some parts back on. And, you know, you, if you've been and done any mechanic and you're always looking for washers and an extra bolt and things, and, you know, you take and you say, well, I'm two washers short, but that's okay. They're not necessary. And you go up there, I'm one bolt short. I don't have, I'm missing a bolt, but that's all right. I'm in a hurry. I'll just put it on with three bolts. It needed four to start with. And now then you've redesigned the automobile. Who gave you the the expertise and know how to do that. Are you an automobile designer? Are you a scripture writer? Or are you a one who is in there? See, you better, you better know who you are when you start tinkering with the Word of God. Adding to or taking away. It's important. Let's start our scriptures, our teaching today from the scriptures. Let's go over to Isaiah 20. Eight and you want Mark sixteen? Oh, okay. Excuse me. I thought we'd already covered that, but Mark sixteen, he says here, uh, fifteen, starting verse fifteen, he said to them, "Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature." Now, first, let's go up to fourteen. It's always good to take it in context. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will be lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, you know, it doesn't say believers follow signs, does it? It says signs follow believers. So, you know, uh, you, you just begin to walk in that Scripture. And I remember there was a time we got that Scripture up on our wall at home. And uh, I can remember when I was going through the rejection part and getting free of the some of the things and that because... After all, I'm just an old welder, and, and God's called you to ministry, and who do you think you are? And you're going to be you're teaching casting out demons out of Christians and stuff, and the, the local people don't agree with that, and so who do you think you are? I mean, I'm, I'm coming back, so I put that up on the wall and left it there, and I said, well, Lord, that's your word, and I believe it, and I'm not going to take it out. And I'm not going to take it down. Either either we're going to cast out demons in this ministry, or we're going to close it down. Forget it. I mean, if we can't do the whole thing, why should we want to do part of it? And so I began to take that attitude. Now, over in Matthew, he says uh, in the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things that I've taught you. Now, what's one of the... the Three basic ways of teaching. You tell, and you show, and then you let them do it. Demonstration, isn't it? Yes. And so Jesus, everything he did was a demonstration, wasn't it? Yes. He said, I don't do anything I don't see the Father do, and I don't say anything I don't hear the Father say. 
Now that's good instruction, isn't it? So as, as teachers, we have the responsibility of going through there and finding out, did Jesus cast demons out? How did he do it? Well, we take the scriptures, give us plenty of understanding there. And now we want to go over to uh, Isaiah 28 and uh, see who he teach doctrine. And verse 9 down through oh, about 13. Whom will he teach knowledge, and whom will he make to understand the message? The word there is doctrine. Uh, doctrine means teaching, what's being taught, what's being put out, put forward. And so he says, who is that? Whom will he teach knowledge, and whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, and line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now, that's the way God teaches. And you hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it, and one day the light goes on and you say, Ah, oh, I finally see it. One brother tells, says the same thing and gets up over here and another brother or another sister comes along and uses the same scripture and says the same thing over. Another brother gets up over here and says the same thing and you've heard it three times and finally you're sitting there and the light goes on and you say, Aha! I finally see it. You've heard it three times in one day <laughs> and the light finally dawned on you. You finally That's what we call the aha theory of teaching. <laughs> How many of you have had that experience? I mean, you've heard it and heard it and heard it, and all of a sudden it becomes a revelation to you, and it's like as if you'd never heard it before. Just now it just come on. Our sister here was teaching, has been teaching here for years. She's probably one of the people that started out with the aha theory. <laughs> but to see a child or somebody that's being taught out there, and they've just been so thick-headed, you know, you just thought they'll never get it. And you used to think about it yourself. You say, Lord, I've tried with that. I've searched that scripture. I've prayed about it. And I don't have the understanding on it that I need. And one day, well, it'll begin to just open up. All of a sudden, it's, it's that, that's your day. The light's on. But he says, For with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to this people to whom he said... This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Yes. Now, there's a lot we could minister on that particular part of Scripture, but that's not our purpose today. Uh, just ask the Lord to give you understanding on those scriptures because if you've been, if you've thought, well, man, I'm awful thick-headed, I'm awful thick here to get through, and you've just been getting it precept upon precept and here a little and there a little, uh, don't despair. There's some of you today is going to receive the Word of God and revelation because it's your time, and God has commanded everybody to submit to everybody because you've got truth that I need. And God's waiting, and we're waiting for you to come forth one day and share what you have. And so I like to go to meetings where people are sharing and bringing the Word out, because I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, well, I pick my pencil up, and I say, there's one for me. And I mark it. One brother said one time, if you've got a Bible you can't mark on in, throw it away and get you one you can. I mean, if your Bible's too holy that you can't make a mark in it and make notes in it and put dates in it and things... Well, throw it away and get you one you mark in. It's just, uh, as you study in that, you're going to mark it and put the date on it, and that was the day that became a revelation to you. And so I've got to listen to my sister over here. I've got to listen to my brother. I've got to pay attention. And so when somebody's teaching that, I don't go sit someplace else and get out of the... I try to get right in where I can hear it, because I'm looking for those little things that I'm going to get out of that, because when Jesus feeds these sheep, he wants everybody to receive something. Yeah. When he sees, he receives, comes into a mixed multitude like this, he's not going to just feed four or five people over here. He wants to feed everybody in this meeting place. Now, somebody, one person will receive it at one level, another person will receive it at another level, but it's all going to be precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. 
So there's no use trying to get in a great big hurry and learn it all overnight. Won't work. There's no 90-day wonders with God. Amen. Take your time. You got to. You got to. You know, you're you're at, running out of time, but God's got all the time He needs. Amen. God is not short of time. We are. We've only got one lifetime to do what we're going to do, and that's it. But God has plenty of time to do whatever He has planned with you and me. Amen. So don't despair because you're not out in the leadership in that. Just stay faithful. Get hooked, get hooked up and in harness and just stay harnessed up and pulling for Jesus. Amen. And you'll be all right. When were they used to say, haul freight for Jesus? If you're, if you're going to work, you're going to haul freight, well, you might as well be sweating and working for Jesus as you had out here working for the devil. So, now, in rejection, you go back and start in the place where Jesus began to teach on the light. He began to teach on you're the light of the world and he's the light of the world. And he became came forward to a bunch of people of his day and that and was rejected totally. No man was ever more rejected than Jesus. And he's the Son of God, came preaching the Word of God and bringing deliverance and healing to the people. And the masses, by large, rejected him. And so when he hung on the cross, he was hanging there and he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God forsake his Son? Because we were forsaken and he was forsaken in your place. See yourself, you see, he didn't die on his cross. Did you know that? Jesus didn't have a cross. Now, I'm teaching doctrine right now. So he says, who shall he teach doctrine? And had, Well, you've got to come to understand that it's line upon line and precept upon precept. Now, I'm going to explain to you. Jesus was a righteous man. He had no sin. Can we agree to that? Amen. Have we, have we, is that doctrine questionable in this fellowship? The righteousness and the Son of God. Now, uh, the cross was made for sinners. In fact, it was made for the. It was a, a way of an ignominious way of, of killing the most vile sinners. And so, here was Jesus declared a sinner, and who was it that went free in his place? Barabbas, wasn't it? So Barabbas's cross is the one that Jesus died on. And Jesus, uh, Barabbas went free. And so here's Jesus hanging on Barabbas' cross. See, he was no sin, no sin in him, but he became sin. Yes. He became rejected of God that we might be accepted in him of God. That's square one for your rejection. Ephesians 1 6 says that you are accepted in the beloved. God has made you accepted in the beloved. See, there was no way of being reconciled to God without an intermediator, and Jesus was the intermediator sent by God to reconcile us. Now, if God did that, what would make you think that he would reject you? But we have a problem with rejection because we grew up in a family situation where there was insufficient love. Maybe the father left the home early and there was a divorce and the little children, especially the little girls, grew up without ever feeling a godly touch of a godly man and love. And so you, you come up in rejection. You just picked it up naturally if you didn't have the right kind of relationship at home. And if you were a man in the same way, if a man, a big old strong man, if you grew up in a home like I did, uh, my fa parents were oil field workers, and, and from the time that I remember, I never remember my dad ever hugging me. We just didn't do that. I mean, from the time I was a little bitty boy, we learned to shake hands. That's the way men did it. And so I grew up never experiencing the real tender love of a father who loved me, but was unable to show it. He went out and worked and provided and fought and drank and done all the things that men did in the oil field and provided for the family. But I never had 
the experience of having a big old strong man put his arm around me and tell me that he loved me until I went to a meeting one time and the, when I got saved. And a brother came up to me that I knew on the job and he came in and he, uh, when I came in, well, he was surprised to see me. And he came up to me and he put his arms around me and hugged me and he says, I love Jesus. <coughs> and of course, back in, our, in that time, well, I was thinking, oh, oh, watch out, these guys are homosexuals. There's something wrong with a man when he hugs a man. Something wrong, you know, when a man hugs a man, that type of thing. And so I was on guard. But when he said, and put his arms around me and he said, I love Jesus, immediately something went off inside of me and said, I wish I could say that. <coughs> It takes a real man to hug a man and to hug his children, to love them. And if you grew up without that, you missed what God intended for you to get an experience. And to this very day, you're suffering from it if you haven't had it dealt with. Because it's called inability to give and receive love. There, you have never received the ability to give and receive love because you have never been loved unconditionally. The only time I have seen, the first time I met unconditional love was when I met Jesus. I mean, he died on a cross for me when I was his enemy. I mean, he loved me to that point because he had a purpose to reconcile me to God. And the demons had come into me because of the flesh, and that's a good place for demons to dwell. And they came in and had me thinking that I was a macho man and that anybody that hugged another man was, a, was some kind of a queer and all the other stuff that went on. And so I was leery, to say the least, and I was in a strange place among strange people. You know, when you come into a bunch of people that talk about demons and talk about deliverance and talk about the words, you're amongst a strange bunch. <laughs> and rejection... Begets rejection. That's right. Love begets love. Forgiveness begets forgiveness. So the first things you have to learn to do is to forgive, except yourself. How many of you in here, don't show your hands, just think, I'm just going to ask a question. How many of you rejected yourself? How many of you reject yourself still to this day? You've been Christians for years and you're still feeling that rejection. See, it's deep, deep rooted. Because it's based upon conditional love. As long as I have to measure up to be loved, then I'm looking at conditional love. And that's what we've been conditioned for because, you know, we give rewards for those that do well, don't we? You go to school and we have a grade system. We've got A, B, C, D, and right on down. And if you're down here in the bottom of the group and that, well, you don't take much effort for that. You can just coast along. But if you're up here in this A group, that means you really work your little tail off, doesn't it? I see our, our brothers here that are doctors now. I mean, well, let me tell you something. They went to school, and they worked hard, and they got rewarded for it. They were able to remember things and able to do dissertations and all kinds of things. And so you know why they reward them? They let them do some more. They just keep loading them up because they had to have some way of qualifying them to be doctors. That's right. And how are you going to get qualified to be a doctor if you don't go through a hundred different things over here and learn all these things? As one guy said one time, he says, the smart people in class, he says, we all had to learn the presidents, but he says, the smart people, they got to learn the vice presidents too. <laughs> they just keep loading you up. See, it's conditional. Jesus is not that way. He did it for you, and all you have to do is receive it. Now, that's the starting place. It's by grace through faith and not of works. The biggest problem you can get is trying to work yourself to a place to where you become worthy of anything. See, God accounted us worthy when he sent Jesus to the cross, didn't he? Because it was all he was going to require out of us was that we make a decision to receive him. Repent, turn about, receive Jesus. So that's where your rejection is being worked with. The, the girls that never had a father that could love them, the, the little boys that never had a father that could love them, usually your problems are with your relationship to your father. Today, 
This nation is under a curse of divorce because we have people that are so self-centered. They come and they get three or four children and they, they, the t- things get tight and they can't make it. And what do they do? The men run out and leave those little children for the women to raise. And those little children never experience the real love of a father. You can imagine what this country is going to be at if we continue like we're going. It's important that little girls and little boys have a father at home that can love them. Grandma can't do it. Grandpa can't do it. It's a good substitute, but it's not what God's plan. And the rejection that's there, and I can look around through this auditorium and just pick out different ones. And then I can watch people who are, who are ministering and see the rejection because you want to be accepted and so you come in and learn about deliverance and so then you get over there and you start trying to do deliverance on everybody so you can be accepted amongst the deliverance work. And all you're doing is just being more rejected because people become suspicious of you. You're not accepted because what are you doing? You're working to gain acceptance among a group that's already rejection. I mean, even though we're doing deliverance, we, we've still got the rejection. And you have to understand that the spirits that's in you, those demon spirits that are in there, they hate you, and they hate the deliverance worker. I was praying for a young man not too long ago, and we sat down to pray, and he had had a problem with his father, and his father had disciplined him, and they ran out and had a real falling out. And uh, so... I was kind of being a father to him, and he was depending on me and, and kind of handled me that way. And his father had died. And I looked at him and I said, You spirit of hatred for this brother. And I called his name. I said, You spirit of hatred for that brother, and you spirit of hatred for Brother Dean. You come out in the name of Jesus. Now, there's a spirit of hatred for you and a hatred for the person that's praying for you. Because these demons hate everything that names the name of Jesus. Understand that. And it'll help you to understand how to work on these things. And so the first thing you do is you just go after that spirit of hatred. Because as a deliverance worker, the first thing he wants to do is get you rejected. If he can get you rejected, then you get on the defensive. And you have to realize that I'm accepted in the Beloved, and every demon hates every Christian. So get it to settle that the enemy is not your friend. Then there's there's a person inside of you, if you're just beginning in that, there's a little bitty emaciated person in there that we call a Christian. And he's a spirit man inside of you, and he's very small. And usually if you've been... I'm in a backslidden condition that the enemy will just cover over him and try to just squeeze him down to where you're having a real struggle even naming the name of Jesus and being a Christian. Now, that's the real person that's an addiction and has real problems in that. But see, what we're doing in deliverance is we're beginning to open that up and let a little light in so that this person can begin to receive some help and grow. And as you grow, the first thing you want to learn how to do is just like taking our little children when we're having deliverance. We'll call a little child over and say, Hey, uh, son, young man, uh, sweetheart, little girl, would you tell that demon to leave? And those little kids do what daddy tells them or mama tells them, don't they? And they'll just say, You demon, you go in Jesus' name. And that demon gone. See, they're not fighting all the things that we have to fight and struggle with. And, and, that, and the, the child knows that they've been told to do it, do it. And they just, in a childlike way, follow the instructions of the instructor. And, you know, Jesus said, unless you become as a little child, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Right. And we try to enter in full growing. But when it comes to being obedient to Jesus, we just have to be like a little child and learn to do what he says do. Now, to help you to get some understanding from Ephesians 1.6, let's read that one, because you need to see where it's at. You need to see the Scripture, because the demons don't want to take anybody's word. And there's a lot of deception out, and so you need to see the word. 
So here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, I think it is, uh, starting with verse 5, having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. See, we're predestinated that when we receive Jesus, we become sons of God. According to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. He has made us accepted in the Beloved. That's square one. If God made you accepted, who can unmake you? So that puts you in, in a good ground, in a good place. In the Beloved, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. It's not works, it's grace. It's God made it possible. He knew you couldn't do any of this for yourself. He knew that there was no way we could measure up. We knew, he, he knew was all we had was a want to. How many of you have had a want to and couldn't? But you had a want to. Well, that's all God requires. If you've got a want to, He'll work with that. So He made it possible for all of those that want to that can. can. Now, as we begin to see this going on. Let's see. Let's go over to... I've got so many things and we're running out of time and I want to cover uh, Luke 7, Luke chapter 7, verse 28. And let's read down from about verse 24 down through about 28 of Luke chapter 7. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously appareled and live in luxury are in king's courts. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet... This is he whom it, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before you, before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Now, what he's saying here, more than a prophet. John the Baptist was more than a prophet, was he? What made him more than a prophet? He was a prophet that was prophesied to come. There's no other prophets in the, in, the, in the Bible that was prophesied to come. John the Baptist is the only prophet that was prophesied to come, and he was going to prophesy, he was prophesied to come and bear witness to the prophet, Jesus. And so he was more than a prophet. He was a prophet's prophet, or a prophet prophesied to prophet, to be a prophet. And he says, and then it, when you understand that, then he says in verse 28, For I say to you, among those born of women... There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. We're in the kingdom. And he says, anybody in here is greater than John the Baptist. Now, why is that? That's a question, isn't it? That brings up, uh, your, that goes beyond your rejection, doesn't it? Jesus said you were greater than, a, than John the Baptist. Who are you to argue with Jesus? Right. Are you greater than John the Baptist? Jesus said you were, regardless of how you feel about yourself, how rejected, how in a, incapacitated you are, how in, in unable you are to perform and do the things that Jesus is saying to do. You've got all these things, see, so you've got condemnation and guilt for failure and all the other things that come with it. But you've got to learn to agree with Jesus and not your enemy. The accuser of the brethren is the devil. And how many of you in here have ever helped him? Man, I have. I've been his. I've been his little helper so many times. But we need to. We need to determine that we know who the accuser of the brethren is, and I am not going to help him. He don't need my help. He does a good job without me. If he can just get me to agree with him, that's all he needs. And so we need to disagree with that. Amen. Now, these are all spirits. We're dealing with spirits. We're dealing with spirits that uh, at mental agreement. The devil says you're no good, and you say amen. The devil says you can't do it, and you say amen. 
You know, the devil comes on you with all this kind of stuff, and you just sit there and agree with him. And he says, who do you... And then he comes along and says, well, who do you think you are? And you have to understand that, devil, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not full-blowing yet, but I do know one thing, and that is the Word of God says I have authority over you. And because of your place there, and whenever you feel that rejection, just stop right there and say, now, wait a minute. God has made me accepted, and I refuse to be rejected. Now, people can reject me. Uh, Glenn and Irma up here in this camp, they came up here to do a work for the Lord. And now the people down in Hot Springs, Arkansas, from what I understand, pretty well reject all this work. All the time and effort and everything they put their heart into, and their own neighbors and friends downtown that they would like to minister to, reject them. And it puts a real strain on you whenever you're rejected by people that you love and you're endeavoring to work with. But when you become a gift, sent of God to a community or a group of people. Now, the deliverance workers are gifts to the body of Christ that need deliverance. Jesus said if you're the sick man needs a doctor, the one that's not sick don't need a doctor. And so... There's a lot of people out there that don't need deliverance. If you don't believe it, ask them. <laughs> I'm just saying what they say and what Jesus said. You know, if you're not sick, you don't need a doctor. And so they're not sick, don't have any problems. They're doing fine. Until they begin to question it at one time, and then you say, okay, well, the Lord will show you, and you just leave them alone. And let them cook a while. And once they become aware of it, that precept upon precept and being snared and taken begins to take over. And a week or two later, they'll come back and say, well, would you pray for me? Well, I believe I do have a problem. But they didn't, they didn't know they had a problem until somebody brought it to their attention. But a gift has to be accepted in the same spirit that it's given in in order to be a valid gift. Hear me now. If, if God gave me to you or gave you to me as a gift to minister to me and I refuse to receive it because I didn't agree with it or we had some problem, then it's not being received in the same spirit that it was given. And it's not going to be a completely effective gift because there's two things that have to work in, in the things of God and that is faith built upon the hearing of the Word of God and love and that mutual acceptance. So we have to come to that. We have to get to that place to where we can mutually accept and agree. And, and so many people can't do that because they're going to be Methodists, Baptists. <laughs> you know, they all got their little thing and you, you do yours and leave us alone. We, oh, you speak in tongues? Well, we don't do that here. They do that down there. You know. Got a lot of problems in the church. And so... Understand that you're, that you're in amongst all of that, and God's endeavoring to alleviate that from the people who want to be alleviated. The ones who don't, leave them alone. God will take care of them next week. Don't try to go out and push stuff on people. Right. Just walk in the Lord and praise God for places like this where you can come and hear a message of deliverance. And uh, understand that Jesus said that you are greater than John the Baptist. And there's no prophet of the Old Testament greater than John the Baptist. That places you up on a pretty high place on a scale. Now that means that we, that don't mean that we all feel that right now, but it means that's where we can come to. We've got to fight everything that keeps us that says, no, you're not. Because Jesus said it. Yes, we are. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And so there's where we go from. Now, we're going to stop there. We could go on and on in this. But understanding that you are of great value to God. He paid a great price for you. And He does not want you dragging around, feeling like that you are not worthy of His love. Trying to get yourself to a place to where you can be accepted. That just won't work. So, let's... Stop there and spend a few minutes praying. Hallelujah. Casting out demons. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we forgive every person who has in any way offended us.
right now we just blanket forgiveness and Lord we thank you for your word and Holy Spirit we thank you that when the Holy Spirit is present there's love and joy and demon manifestations there's the love and joy of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God but then there is the demons that are in there that are disquieted and and uh, fearful and quaking and they know they've got to go so every spirit right now every trembling spirit that's here of fear of being cast out we command you to go right now now everybody in here just take a deep breath and say this say go in Jesus name go. Go. all rejection all unworthiness Now remember, every believer can cast demons out. Now the first place you start casting them out is out of yourself. So just tell him, say, go. So you lying spirits has been telling me that I'm no good, that I'm unworthy, that I can't do it. You've got to go right now. In Jesus' name, I command you to go. I said, folks, just do your own deliverance. Just speak to it. In Jesus' name. Condemnation. Spirits of condemnation, you go in Jesus' name. You leave these people. Now, the spirit lying spirits. You lying spirits that tell them they're not worthy. Tell us all we're not worthy. They tell us we can't do it. They tell us that, that Jesus is, that we're not of any value. We're not equal to those John the Baptist. And Jesus says we're greater. And we command those spirits to go. Every spirit of agreement with the devil, the demons, every spirit of agreement, you go in Jesus' name. We fall out of agreement. We disagree with you. We will not agree with the enemy. Every spirit that says, who are you? You go in the name of Jesus. Every spirit that asks you, who are you? Who do you think you are? Just tell him, say, I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I cast out demons, and you've got to go. You've got to get out of my mind. Get out of my mind, because you're... Here's where the problem is, folks. It's in your mind. It's in your thinker up here. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God for pulling down strongholds, and every spirit... Spirit that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Those are the ones we want to get. Those ones that are up here exalting themselves against the knowledge of God. You go in Jesus' name. I am loved unconditionally. Every spirit of conditional love, you go in Jesus' name. And I am loved unconditionally. God loves me, and He loved me when I was His enemy, and I have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And everything, every spirit contrary to that has to go. Now, Antichrist spirits, every Antichrist spirit that would try to come in and say this is not so, that Jesus did not go to the cross and die, and came in the flesh and went to the cross and died, buried and resurrected, and at the right hand of the Father and made a way for me to come into fellowship with God, every spirit that denies that has to go right now. In Jesus' name. Every antichrist spirit, you have to go. You get out of my brothers and sisters right now. For Jesus did come in the flesh. It's a historical fact. It's a historical record. And he came and broke the power and destroyed the power and the bindings and the things of the devil so that he now has no more power over God's people. Now, that's, that's spirits of antichrist. And you, we have to learn to... Spell them out. Because they're the ones that say, Oh no, you can't get free. But the Scripture says Jesus came and completed the work and set us free. We are set free. It's a past tense thing. We, we need to start enjoying it. Thank you, Lord. Now, every little girl in here who is suffering because of 
not having sufficient love from her father and cannot relate to a man because of that, I command those spirits out right now in the name of Jesus. Now, every spirit, man in here, every man, regardless of the age, that never had the love of a father when he was growing up. They had support, they had all, everything else, but they never had a father that could just humble himself to the place of coming and hugging them and telling them, I love you, son, I appreciate you, and I love you, and I uh, just want to hold you in my hands and tell you so. Now, all of you that had that situation, I want you to do this. Forgive your father. Say, I forgive my father. In Jesus' name. You're releasing him, but also you're releasing yourself. Remember, you're tied. Any offense that you ever suffered tied you to the person that caused the offense with an invisible cord, and you're the only one that can break it. If they're dead, you're still tied to it. You can't help them there, but you need to release yourself by releasing them. And so I forgive my father. Now, you little girls that went through the same thing, you release your father. Now, if you had a problem with your mother, family members, release your mother. Say, I forgive my mother. I realized my dad didn't know how to give and receive love. My mother didn't know how to give and receive love. I just have to forgive her and walk in whatever they provided and realize they did the best they could. Don't condemn them and accuse them. God says bless them. And so I bless my children, bless my family, bless my mother and father and my uh, grandfathers. And if they was divorced and that in your family, you were brought up in that situation, say, Father, I forgive my mother and father for that divorce. Doesn't make it right. You're not saying that they're right. What you're saying is that you don't want to be tied to that anymore. Otherwise, you're going to be tied to it the rest of your life and you will be a prisoner of your past. Does Jesus want us being prisoners of our past? No way. He wants us to be new creatures in Him. Able to walk is a new creature. So let's, let's forgive those who have injured us in any way and cause our hurts and begin to walk free. You, you'll have power in what you say whenever you forgive. Mark eleven twenty three and 24 there says that when you stand praying, forgive. For if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. So our, our condition with God is that we be willing to do as Jesus did and say, Father, forgive them for they didn't know what they were doing. And God will forgive us because we didn't know what we were doing. We can receive that forgiveness. Okay? Now, all unforgiveness has to leave right now in Jesus' name. We loose these people from unforgiveness right now. All unforgiveness in Jesus' name. Now, as the Lord shows you in the days to come, as you go along, the Lord, you'll be driving along and the Lord will bring something up. Just say, yeah, Father, I'm guilty. And I forgive that person, and I ask you to forgive me, and I write the relationship, and if you would so make it possible, I'll even go to that person. If you will bring them past my past or something, I'll go to them and make restitution. I'll do what I can to make things right. But you don't have to go looking for the people. Just walk with God, and if God so brings the person past your, past your path, say, tell them, say, Sister... I, and I think of some little girl that back in my high school days that I mistreated and abused. I say, Sister, I'm sorry for the way I treated you back then. I was wrong. And I know it's left you injured. It's left you hurt all of this time. And God has brought you past my path, and I want to make it right to you. I want to ask you to forgive me. That will get you a good spirit, and when you've got a good spirit, you can grow. Okay? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. But unforgiveness is a mean spirit. brings on bitterness because you don't understand. But remember, every offense that you suffered left you tied to the person who brought the offense. And you need to break the tie, and the way you do it is by forgiving the person who injured you. Release them. All right? And grow. Now, from here on, it's grow, grow, grow. We're going to put some miracle grow on there and let you grow. You know, you're a flower that's been held down, and now then we're beginning to get some light in there so you can begin to grow in your Christian experience and the love of God. All right? How many of you want to do that? Want to grow? Thank you, Lord. You've been a, you've been a good audience. I appreciate you. Love you.
and look, look forward to seeing all of you in glory. I'm, if I don't see you before and I, we get to glory, and you'd like to see me up there, remember, you'll find me real close to the throne. And I, I hope to see you real close to the throne. Let's, let's get as close to the throne as we can, and that way when we get there, well, we'll be able to say, hey, I remember you. But if you're way off in the backside someplace, I'll have a hard time finding you. So let's all draw close to the throne, and we'll, if we don't meet before, we'll meet in glory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That, that hurt, that spirit of hurt from her, from her, the people that were supposed to love her, that spirit of hurt come out right now in Jesus' name. That's deep hurt, deep hurt, come out of there in Jesus' name. Come on, loose her and come out. Deep hurt. That comes from getting your heart broken so many times and crying out and coming to a place and you cry out and you become vulnerable and people come in and they misuse and abuse you and you get hurt. And it's deep hurt and it's got to come out in Jesus' name. So you get free today, Lord. We bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, Glenn? Father, we come this morning in the name of the Lord Jesus to be intercessors in behalf yes, of the yes. household of faith. Yes. Behalf of our nation and those in authority over us, for it's written in your word to remember, first of all, our president and those in authority over us. And if my people who are called by your name will humble ourselves and pray, you'll hear from heaven and will heal our land and will heal the, hear the prayers that are made in this place. So this morning, Father, we come to stand in the gap and make up the hedge and to be intercessors for the abominations that's in this land. I bind the spirit of pleasure. I bind the spirit of antichrist. I bind the spirit, the spirit of abortion. I bind the spirit of witchcraft and sorcery in this nation. And I break the bondage of it and I have Appropriate the name of the Lord Jesus. Stand against it in the authority of the word that Jesus said that he hear our prayers if we come and be stood in the gap and made up the head. We come today to stand in that place and to be intercessors for this nation. To cry, Lord, spare thy people, spare thy people, spare thy people, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, the abominations are great. But, oh, God, you said that you'd hear our prayers and answer. Yes, We've come today yes. to bring up the sins yes. and the abominations of yes, this nation. Yes. And, Father, that you'd hear and answer and bring conviction across this land. That you'll cause men and women and boys and girls and cause each one of us to call on the name of the Lord and yes, repent. Lord. And to make Jesus Lord of Lords and King of Kings. For he is Lord of Lords yes. and King of Kings. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we just stand and repent for this sin. Oh God, we repent. We fall on our face before you, Lord. We cry out for your forgiveness. Lord God, we confess to you the sin. Yes, Lord Jesus. We confess to you our sin, Lord Jesus. People, just begin to speak out to the Lord. Yes, Lord. You know the areas in your life. Yes, Lord. And to give it up to the Lord. You shall make your prayer to Him, and He will hear you, and you will pay your vows. You know, when we vow, pretty important. You shall, you shall also decide and decree a thing, and it shall be established for you, and the light of God's favor shall shine upon your ways. When they make you low, you will say there is a lifting up, and the humble person he lifts up and saves. Oh, this is one. He will even deliver the one for whom you intercede, who is not innocent. In other words, they're really guilty. Yes, he, that person will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank Whatever you, Jesus. we're delivered of. We have authority then. That's what we need, authority, but we have to repent. Yes. We have to repent. See? Mm-hmm. That's Job 22.30 in the Amplified. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. 
It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.